Hey, this is Jamie with Stonemeyer Games, and for day, today's Sunday sit-down video, I'm gonna kind of be catching up a little bit. I play a lot of games, um, often a lot of games for the first time, and I like to talk about them in my weekly game design videos, Tuesday and Friday, but sometimes I get pretty behind on that list, and so this is one of those days where I'm gonna use the Sunday sit-down to catch up on some of these games that maybe I, I couldn't think of a full-fledged video um, to get into. You can see Walter back there trying to open that door. He's not very good at it. Um, so I have 12 games that I've been wanting to talk about in some way, but I don't really think I can do a full video about any individual uh, games on this list. So I'm just going to talk about them in no particular order and name quickly my favorite mechanism in each of them. I have photos of some of them. I don't think I own any of these games, though. So we'll just be getting photos of a few of these games. Um, let's start with Hermagore, which is a game that I do not have a photo of. Hermagore is kind of two games in one. It's a, uh, it's a bidding game, an auction game, and it's also a game that a lot of the action takes place on a map. And the bidding element of it is something that I was really fascinated by because it uses a spatial bid bidding element that reminded me a lot of a game that I'm instantly forgetting the name of. It's the Stefan Fell game, Carpe, Di Carpe Diem, the new Stefan Fell game. Um, but it's a little bit different than Carpe Diem in that it's a spatial element where you have all these tiles that are on a board and you're placing tokens over a bidding round um, on the corners and on the edges of these tiles. And so if you put it on like, if you put a token, uh, one of your tokens on, um, on the edge of a tile, then it's actually usually between two tiles. And so you're essentially bidding on both of those tiles. And by bidding, I just mean that um, at the end of this uh, bidding round, you will look at the position of each of your tokens and in relative to the tiles that are out there. So you actually look at each tile and say, okay, who has the, which player has the most tokens around this tile? And that player will win that tile. It was just an interesting twist on an auction mechanism that I enjoyed. Um, another game that uh, I, I may talk about later when I actually get my real copy. I only played a prototype of Tussie Mussy. This is the other game by Elizabeth Hargrave, the designer of Wingspan, which we publish. Tussie Mussy is published by Buttonshy Games. And it is a, an I Cut You Choose game, which is one of my favorite genres of games. And Tussie Mussy does something really cool, and it's so elegant. I probably could do a whole video on it, but it's so elegant that it's really just um, it's th this simple. Every turn, uh, you're going to have two cards in your hand that you've drawn. And you will look at both of them, and you'll put one of them face up on the table and one of them face down. And I believe it's the player to your right is going to choose one of those cards to become their own, and you get to keep the other card as your own. You flip it face up and, and keep it in your tableau. And this is just a, a really clever, brilliant I cut you choose mechanism that A, allows for simultaneous player interaction, or si simultaneous turns, because all players are doing this at the same time. You're making the decision at the same time, you're deciding at the same time, which I like in I cut you choose. You, often I cut you choose, it is not simultaneous. Um, but I also just like that the, the cutting element isn't that you're removing a card or you're dividing things into two stacks. Rather, all you're deciding is what information the player to your right or left, if I have that incorrect, is going to have. Um, because one card will be face up, one card will be face down. So you're kind of, uh, you're kind of deciding, okay, what, what you're looking at that other, that other player's tableau and deciding, okay, what card do they really want? Which card do I want? And do I decide to entice them with the card that maybe there's a card that you definitely want them to have and a card that you definitely want you to have. You might entice them with a face-up card. You might entice them with a face-down card. It's just a really interesting decision, um, a simple decision, but but a really interesting one. Which card do I place face-up or face-down? That's in Tussie Mussy. Here's a game that I actually have a photo of. This is Rise of Tribes. This is not a photo of my favorite mechanism, though, even though I really do enjoy the dice mechanism in this game. Um, in Rise of Tribes, it has this really cool thing uh, that, that I probably could do a video about, which is that um, there are some hexes on a board, and the board the board is uh, the size of it depends on how many players that you have. And there is a uh, combat mechanism to the game, but it doesn't trigger when you enter a territory controlled by an opponent. So say you're playing blue and you have two workers um, or two units, whatever they're called in the game, two units on a territory, and I move three units in. Uh, nothing happens then because, and we both like essentially share the territory. We don't share control, but we share uh, utility of that tile for resource produ production and for movement and for uh, recruiting. Um, we don't actually fight until there are sev a total or of seven or more units in that tile on that territory which I thought was a really clever way of doing it. So it means that um, 
you're not ever really feeling blocked in at any given time. There are, there are many territories you can enter without having to worry about uh, combat happening. There's a little bit of negotiation that can happen. You can kind of say, hey, can, can, I, can we share this tile for a minute? I'm, I'm not going to attack you. I'm not going to put uh, enough workers in there that would create a combat situation. And it just it, it created a, a really neat thing that I don't think I've seen in the game because like the basic uh, default method of uh, having combat happen in the game is when two opponent units end up in the same territory, but not so in Rise of Tribes. You have to hit that seven unit threshold before any combat happens, meaning that multiple different opponents, even three, I think maybe even four opponents could be in the same territory without any conflict happening in that territory, which I thought was pretty cool. That's from Rise of Tribes. The next game I don't have a photo of because I'm sure I do somewhere, but I think I actually have a video of it. And this is of a game called Dude. And Dude, uh, you're given, each player is given their own, actually, no, you're not given your own deck of cards. You draw from a deck of cards, um, I believe. Maybe you have your own deck. I don't remember. It doesn't really matter in the game because uh, on these cards is written the word dude, but it's written in different ways. It's written, there's a plain dude. There's a dude that has a, a bunch of O's in the middle, a like dude. There's a very small dude. There's a loud dude in all caps. So it's basically the same word written in a variety of other ways. And what you do in this game is you look at your own card, the current dude card that you have, and you say that word, that version of dude, in a way that conveys your card to the other players. And if at any time, so Sam's saying dude, and you're saying dude, and we think we're kind of making eye contact, we think that we have the same card in hand, um, we can say sweet, and we reveal the card to each other. Um, and if they are the same card, then you get to keep it as a point. If it's not the same card, you have to discard it. It's silly fun. It sounds so stupid, but it's actually a lot of fun. Like I've had a lot of fun in small doses of playing this game. Um, and the mechanism I think is, I mean, it's a very light mechanism, but it is in the, the entire game, which is that you are communicating the exact same concept, the word dude, but in a variety of different ways using body language and, um, and uh, the, just the way you're saying the word. I think the game really wants you to just say it differently and not necessarily even use body language, but some body language can be used, uh, which I just think is really, really clever. That um, I, I wonder if that could be applied to a heavier game when you're trying to convey information to other players, maybe in a cooperative game, um, conveying the same exact information, but in different ways, I think is an interesting thing that I took away from Dude. The next game is another one that I played at Geekway of the West. I do have a photo of it. This is of Expanse City. Um, and there, there's, it looks like there's a lot going on in this game. It's actually very streamlined. It was very easy to pick up and learn. And basically in the game, you are, you're doing a few different things. You're building these towers up. But the main thing you're doing is placing these tiles on the board. Um, and the thing that I found really interesting about Expanse City, hold this up, is that uh, every tile in the game is going to see play in the game. And so... If you're waiting for a specific park tile to come up or a certain commercial tile to come up, you know eventually it's going to come up and it's going to be added to this board. It may not be in the place that you want it. You may draw it. Some other player may draw it. But you know at some point you are definitely going to see it. And I thought this was a really interesting uh, element to the game. And it allowed for the game to have objective cards that tied specifically to pretty much every tile type in the game because the game knew that you're going to see all these tiles in the game. Whereas I think in many games you might remove tiles for variability or you might have an end game trigger that happens before you've seen all the tiles or, or you might have objectives that are a little bit more generalized. They aren't looking for specific tiles. They kind of hedge their bets as to what you'll actually see or not. But because in this game you see all the tiles and they become part of a common pool of tiles in the city that you're forming, um, you can really plan around a very specific tile showing up because eventually it definitely will show up. So I thought that was pretty clever in Expanse City. The next game on my list, I do have an, another photo of this one. This is Cat Lady. Cat Lady is a delightfully light game about uh, collecting uh, cats and cat toys and um, each of the cat, like a little, anything that goes along with a cat. There's, yeah, I see cat toys, cat food. Um, all the cats are individually named. The art is really cute. I had a lot of fun playing this at, uh, I believe I played this at Geekway Mini. And the thing that I really liked about this game is the spatial selection mechanism. So basically at any time, there's a three by three grid of cards, which you can kind of see in these photos, but it's a three by three grid. You're not seeing the whole grid there. Um, and so on your turn, all you're doing is you're taking the cat token, which didn't show up in my photo. 
Uh, but there's a cat token that you're going to place either on a row or a column, and then you get all of the cards in that row or column. Which uh, I thought was a really, really elegant way of... It was essentially a car, card drafting. We're drafting cards, but not passing cards around the table. We're selecting them from a common pool. But... It provided some really interesting decisions because you're seeing nine cards at any given time, but you're kind of uh, limited by, by that spatial element of rows or columns as to which uh, set of cards you're going to take. You don't have to pay anything. You're just taking those cards and you keep them. But it provided some really interesting decisions, um, and I thought it was a nice thing that could be implemented in other games. If you have a game where you need players to select cards on an ongoing basis, um, or any component on an ongoing basis, to have them select one row or column, I thought was really interesting. To give you a few different options, um, six different options, but uh, you're, you're getting different combinations of things at different times. That is Cat Lady. The next game I thought I had a picture of, but I do not, and that is Cave Paintings. I think, you know, I, I did my video about whiteboards like the day before I played Cave Paintings. And I wish I had included it. I wish I played, recorded that video a little bit later because Cave Paintings is a delightful game that uses a whiteboard um, or, or dry erase markers. And in Cave Paintings, the, the real crux of it is that you have a pen, um, a, a dry erase pen, and you can't hold it like you normally would hold a pen or, or a pencil. Instead, you have to hold it like a caveman would hold it, like this. And you draw with your hand like this. And the clever thing that I thought this did is that uh, there are many different drawing games out there um, and some of them give an advantage to players who are better at art or better at illustrating. Cave Paintings completely takes away that advantage or almost completely takes away that advantage and really levels the playing field and provides silly fun because all players have their pen like that. So I really like in a game where um, some players could enter the game as just being inherently more talented than other players. To make the game more silly and more fun, it uses that uh, thematic mechanism of holding a pen like a, like a caveman to, um, to, to level the playing field a little, little bit. That's cave paintings. The next one is archaeology. Um, I believe it's archaeology colon like a, a new discovery, a new adventure, something like that. This is the newest version of archaeology. Uh, a really great game where you're selecting cards and uh, basically doing set collection, a set collection of the game. But it does something really, really cool and thematic, actually, which is that at the beginning of every game, you select a tile that you put on the middle of the table, and that tile uh, relates to a certain card type. I believe it's a, like a map or a treasure, uh, treasure map. It's a map card that you can collect during the game. And depending on the number of maps that you collect, if you decide to discard those maps, you can trigger that an ability on that tile that means that you are exploring that mon that place. So each of the tiles are monuments. They represent, okay, in this game, we're all exploring this pyramid. We're, we're doing an archaeological dig of this pyramid. And the pyramid tile shows you, A, how many maps you need to spend to trigger its ability, and B, what its ability is, because the ability will, will be different every game. Um, for one of the tiles, it's like you put out, at the beginning of the game, you put out three face-down stacks of cards, each escalating, like two cards, four cards, six cards, something like that. And uh, when you discard map cards, uh, depending on how many map cards you discard, you take those piles of face down cards. So it kind of feels like you're digging into the unknown um, of, this, of this pyramid using these maps that you've uncovered during the game. Um, and I really like, I, I like that in a fairly streamlined set collection game, Every game can feel different because of those tiles and because what those tiles add to the game, both in terms of mechanisms and flavor and theme. So that's archaeology, my favorite mechanism in archaeology. Here's a game that I definitely don't have a photo of because it is a digital game. It's a VR game that I played recently uh, that I believe is called, I had to look it up, I believe it's called The Wizards. Uh, my friend have it, had it on his, um, I believe it was a Steam, it was an Oculus VR that, that we played it on. And I have not been very good at VR games that I've played so far, and I was not good at this game, but I really enjoyed it because in The Wizards, you're making hand motions to conjure spells. So there was one like fireball motion that I could not get. It was like you flip your hand upside down like this and you hold fire in your hand. But there was a bow and arrow action where you take your arms, you cross them over, you turn them upright. I think that was it. Yeah, something like that. Um, and you have this, this magical arcana bow and arrow in your hand. You have to pull the arrows out of your, um, from behind you, this uh, quiver behind you, and put them in to the bow and shoot them. And it felt 
in, I can't express how incredibly satisfying it felt to use this thing. To conjure it out of, to have a monster charging at you, and you wave your hands, pull this bow and arrow out, pull an arrow, and shoot the monster. It was incredibly satisfying. I think I felt that way um, playing uh, or close to it in tabletop form, the Harry Potter Hogwarts battle game, where if you want, whenever you play a spell, you can make the motion in the air. I've done that a few of the times I've played it. When we played the full campaign, I did not do that. But uh, but I like the idea of casting spells and really feel like when you use your body that you were actually casting something, casting a spell. That, that little twist um, really immersed me definitely into the VR game and a little bit into the Harry Potter Hogwarts battle game when I played that. So if you want to feel like you're a wizard conjuring things, I would highly recommend checking out the VR game, The Wizards. That's my favorite. The, the hand motions um, are my favorite mechanism in that game. Uh, Feelings. I do have a p photo, a couple photos for this game. So Feelings is a game, it's a little bit like apples to apples, where you are essentially um, giving some scenario. This is, this is where it differs from apples to apples a little bit. You're, you're offering a scenario to all players, and then you're being paired with another player and trying to decide how that player feels about that scenario. Uh, so, and the, the feelings available are shown on the table at any given time. Here's compassion, here's shame, irritation, um, joy, different options for how you could feel during, um, during that round for that scenario. So you'll, you'll read a scenario out loud and each player will uh, try to get in touch with the other player's feelings, which I thought was really interesting for a game. But my favorite mechanism was the uh, the matching, the pairs of players, how the game matched players of players, which was basically that you weren't assigned a team at the beginning of the game because the game really wants you to get to know everyone at the table. So instead, every round, you shuffle up these partner cards and you hand them out to all the players, and that determines your partner for that round, the, the player whose um, feelings you are trying to um, to guess that round. So I really like that that idea of a um, kind of a semi-cooperative game with a partnership mechanism that rotates throughout the game. You're not the same partners with everyone throughout the game. That changes as you play the game, so you get to know everyone better. I thought that was a really clever element of feelings. Um, I'm saying, and you'll see it in the comments, I'm not saying feel links, uh, li licks. It's like linking feelings, feel links. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the description below in case you want to look up the game. Uh, second to last game on the list is Illusion, a really Kramer, I believe this is a Wolfgang, Wolfgang Kramer game, um, really elegant, really streamlined. The whole idea in the game is that you are uh, looking at one of these cards that has a very colorful kind of abstract art on it, and at any given time, like see in, in this round we have a blue arrow here, and so uh, what this is saying is you're going to take this card and based on how much blue is on this card, you are going to put it in a line of other cards in ascending order. So if you think this card has more blue than this card, but less blue than this card, you would wedge it right there in the middle, which I think inherently is a really cool, elegant mechanism for a game that's super easy to teach and play. That said, the, the thing that I really like about the game is that uh, one of the things that you can do on your turn is say, no, something's wrong. Someone, someone put a card into this row in the wrong place. I'm going to call you out on it, and we'll find out who's right. And this is how you win the game. You, you win the game by, uh, by determining um, who, who put the wrong card in. So throughout the game, you're trying to always put the card in the right place and, uh, and, and then at the right times deciding who put the card in into the wrong place on here, which I think is a really clever mechanism. And there's no rule book to refer to. You just look at the back of these cards to see the, uh, the percentages which I thought was really elegant. Um, but I really like that, that idea of actually using your, your turn instead of putting a new card in the tableau to just realize that something's wrong and calling out uh, the other players, whoever, especially whoever put that card down and removing it. That is Illusion. Um, the last game on the list is Blue Lagoon, a very beautiful game that I played uh, with a few friends a, a few months ago. And Blue Lagoon does something that I've seen in Amon Ray and in Brass, which is that... The f and when you play the full version of the game, the first round looks kind of it will end looking kind of like this. And many of the decisions you're making are how to expand your little empire, and you're putting cardboard tokens in the board, and sometimes you're putting wood tokens down whenever you feel like it. And that matters because at the end of that first round of the game, you're going to wipe everything except for the wood off the table. And then you begin again, already controlling some territories with the wooden tokens, and having new places of origin where you can branch off with from at the, at the beginning of the second round, um, or throughout the second round. 
and I bit I I really like this mechanism in games. I I think it it provides just a really nice, interesting decision space as to what am I going to prioritize? Am I going to prioritize getting points right now in this first round? Or, and when uh, do I want to put the permanent structures out there? How, how do I want to position myself for the second half of this game? And I think both, all three of those games, Blue Lagoon, Brass, and Amon Ray, do that really, really well. And I think that's an interesting mechanism that I'd like to see more of, of, of games that have, a, have an element of semi-permanence, or permanence, really, um, that, and that matters like halfway through the game. And a lot of stuff gets wiped away and other stuff is left permanently on the board. I think that's pretty clever. I think that's it. 12 games, 12 mechanisms that I enjoy. Hopefully they've been, uh, uh, they've provided you some food for thought if you're designing a game. If you'd like to comment on any of these games uh, in terms of your favorite mechanism in any of them, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments or just your general commentary about any of these games. I'm open to hearing that and discussing it as well. All right, thanks.